There's a passage in the canon where Ananda comes to the Buddha and says, you know, it's half of this holy life, half of the life of the practice, to have admirable friends. And the Buddha says, don't say that. It's the whole of the holy life. Everything in the practice depends on having admirable friends. And the Buddha gives as an example, if it hadn't been for the Buddha as our admirable friend, where would we be? How would we know anything about the Eightfold Path? How would we know anything about the path to the end of suffering? And the practice unfolds in the context of our friendships, which means you have to choose your friends well, the people you hang around with, the people whose values you you agree with. And the problem is we often pick up the values of the people around us through a process of osmosis, hardly even aware of what we're doing. If you live in a society where everything is measured in terms of monetary worth, it seems normal. And we forget how abnormal it can be. How can money be the worth of a person? The worth of a person lies in their, their qualities of mind, the goodness of the heart, the goodness of their actions. There are lots of things in the world that really shouldn't have a price on them. Remember when we were in India, sometimes we'd find ourselves out in an Indian village and we wanted some water to wash with or to drink, and we'd see a, a well or a pipe in front of a house, and so we'd ask the people in the house if we could use their water. And they looked at us very strangely. We discovered that it was expected that you could just take water. Water was something without a price. You didn't have to ask permission for it. It's common property. Of course, that's not the way it is now. They want to privatize all our water supplies, and people are finding ways to make money off of water. And that becomes the norm. Because, quote, everybody's doing it, unquote. So you have to be very careful to choose your everybody. Because there are lots of activities that everybody is doing that can cause a lot of harm. So the practice of meditation is not just mastering a technique. It's learning to pick up the right values. And this is why the Buddha created the monastic Sangha, a community not only where the monks and the nuns would help each other maintain the right set of values, but the fact that the monks and the nuns depended on lay people meant that the lay people had to have close contact with the monks and the nuns, and that would hopefully cause the, the values of the monastic life to rub off on the lay people. If it's just the example of someone who can live happily on very simple things, without a salary, without owning any money at all. That's a good example. It teaches a lot of things. It helps make you look at your values. It makes you look at your life, what in your life. Have you picked up in the sense of values and ideas from other people that really work against your own best interest? It's good to examine those attitudes, because you usually hide a lot of defilements. Defilement is one of those words that has trouble making its way into Western Buddhism. It's very common over in Asia. People talk about the defilements all the time. But over here, people don't like to hear about it. It's because we tend to regard our greed, anger, and delusion as our friends. And again, we live in a society where everybody takes it for granted that people are going to be greedy, angry, and deluded. And the society actually is arranged to take advantage of that. It becomes not only the norm, but it's also encouraged. And how many times people have complained to me, so if you live content with very little, the economy is going to collapse. Well, if the economy is built on greed, anger, and delusion, maybe it should collapse. It's causing people to do unskillful things, to 
think and act in unskillful ways. It's not good for us. You might say, well, how can we live otherwise? Well, have one foot outside of the, quote, real world, unquote, where you can step back and look at these things from a more detached perspective, detached in the sense of looking at them in terms of the larger picture. We have another chant that we often chant here, subject to aging, subject to illness, subject to death, subject to separation, and I'm the owner of my actions. Whatever I've done, for good or for evil, to that will I fall heir. The Buddha says that's something we should all reflect on, whether we're lay or ordained, reflect on it every day, remembering that our actions have consequences, and the consequences are determined by the quality of our minds the quality of mind that goes into the action. So the things that you, quote, have to do, unquote, to get ahead. But if they're done out of greed, anger, and delusion, you'd be better off not doing them, because they have long-term consequences down the line. Of course, that calls into question getting ahead, but And it's easy, easy for us to look at people in other cultures and the things they do to get, to he, get ahead and the, and the things that they value as signs of social status. And we look at them and it's kind of strange. The insignia, say, that go with wealth and power. If you're from outside the culture, it's, it's all pretty bizarre. Learn to have that kind of attitude towards the culture you live in. Step outside of that culture and realize how bizarre the culture is. It's one of the reasons why the Buddha encourages people to go off into the wilderness. It's a very natural way to pull out of the frenzy of daily life and pull out of the, the rat race. And ask yourself, do you want to be in a race with a lot of rats? You see this in, in filling the literature on wilderness. But then a lot of people who go into the wilderness and think about this for a while, then they go back and they don't have the skills required to maintain that wilderness attitude. This is one of the things that we try to cultivate through the meditation, the ability to carry the sense of the separate center. You stay with your center. Regardless of what's happening outside. And that gives you your separate perspective, where you can step back and look at things. This is why it's so important to develop this as a skill. We're talking today about refuge, a home for the mind. Well, it's also your own internal wilderness. It's good to have a wilderness home in the midst of the city, in the midst of all the frenzy of modern life. have that place where you can step back, even while you're in the midst of all these other activities. So the values and the techniques of meditation go together. This is why it's so important to work on this skill, so you really have it mastered that no matter what, you can stay with the meditation. And this is why your values and the reasons you've come to meditation or your motivation for meditation has to have to be more than just relaxation, stress reduction. You have to do it for your sanity, for your safety. And that sense of the dangers out there, and this is why the Buddha stressed heedfulness as the basic quality underlying all skillful qualities. Heedfulness means a, a very alive sense of the dangers that await you out there, all those stupid things you can do if you fall in line with the general run-of-the-mill set of values. And how important it is, how crucial it is that you have your ability to step back so you don't go with a herd mentality. Don't get caught up in the stampede. So it is dangerous out there because it's all just dangerous in here. The mind so quickly picks up through its greed, anger, and delusion. The ideas out there that foster greed, anger, and delusion. 
if our minds were originally pure, if we really did have that wonderful Buddha nature that deep down inside is our true nature and it's good. But if it's corruptible, what kind of Buddha nature is that? How can you depend on it? We say oh, we're basically pure, but we're corrupted by society. If we were basically pure, we wouldn't be corruptible. So you do have to take a jaundiced eye not only to values out there, but the, your, your, these friends inside, these false friends. who are here only to cheat, cheat you, they're good only in word. They flatter and control, and they lead you to ruinous fun, like it said in the, in the chant just now. You've got to protect yourself from those dangers as well. They're what they call the fifth column. Traditionally, they're called Mara's armies. Mara has his armies inside you. So realize you have to be very careful about who you choose as your friends, both inside and out. Sit down with yourself and ask. Ask yourself, what do you really value in life? What really is important in life? And then develop these qualities of mindfulness, alertness, and ardency. To give yourself that refuge where you can stay true to your values and develop a sense of true, you know, genuine security, genuine well-being. This way your values help the techniques of meditation, and the techniques help your values. So you can have admirable friends. When you find them outside, as the Buddha said, follow those people. If you can't find them outside, the Buddha says go alone, but try to maintain your internal friends wherever you go.